Um, so, so today it's going to be fun because uh, technology is failing us completely, uh, which is okay. Uh, we'll use the the whiteboard um, until and unless things get fixed. Uh, so, what we have seen in the last couple of weeks is the memory systems, right? Both the um, virtual memory and uh, memory hierarchy in terms of caches and so on. And uh, so today I'm going to start on parallel systems, which is chapter 12. So we're slightly changing the order of coverage in the book, uh, right? So we covered up to chapter, chapter 9, which is uh, 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 memory systems, and, and we're skipping 10 and 11, which is on I.O. We'll come back to that later on. Um, and, but we're going to do parallel systems first because it, it's keeping in pace with uh, your, the coverage of projects in your classes, right? So that's what we're going to do. And um, <clears throat> one thing that I want to offer is um, since I didn't get a chance to talk about memory systems to you at all, I'm sure that Alanka did a, um, a great job, but, um, but if you want me to do a review of uh, memory systems, I'm happy to do that for you but it has to be outside of class hours. And so um, pick a Saturday or a Sunday, a three hour block, I'll be here, okay? Pardon me, either this week or next week, depending on what you, pardon me? Yeah, well I know the break is coming up, right? From, uh, uh, from next Monday. So either this Saturday or Sunday or next Saturday and Sunday. Because when you come back from the spring break, uh, the Thursday of uh, the following week, you have your second midterm. And uh, so, uh, and so, this is an offer that I'm going to make to you. That I'm, I'm, I'm uh, happy to do a, um, a review session um, of. Uh, of course, I expect that you would have reviewed it, and then we can have sort of a discussion uh, when we do that. How many of you are interested in a review session like that? Anyone not interested? Okay. Uh, so, so, uh, what's the best way to do it? So, what I'll do is. Um, I'll create a, uh, a Doodle uh, page uh, giving these four options, either Saturday, Sunday of this week or Saturday, Sunday of next week, okay? And, um, and you can, you know, I have to do with maximum attendance, so. No, no, what I'm going to, I cannot do multiple sessions. I'm willing to do one session. Exactly, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you these four options in the Doodle page, uh, and and uh, you can then pick one of those options. Op well, you can use you can pick multiple options, of course. I'm expecting you'll pick uh, multiple options. So what I'll do is a maximum attendance in picking a winner. Okay, um, so we'll do that either this weekend or next weekend. Um, and uh, uh, so today I'll start on. Uh, and, and, that, and, and when we do that, I don't know where we might be able to do that because I don't know whether this classroom will be available for that on a weekend or not, but I'll find out what may be uh, available. But uh, do bring your clickers along because uh, that way we can make it sort of interactive, um, even if we don't count it towards um, uh, the PRS because not all of you may be able to attend it. Um, uh, uh, that, that will make it interactive and useful. Okay, so uh, uh, what we're going to start today is uh, uh, parallel systems. And I think we, we started discussing that even uh, early on when we talked about um, uh, sequential uh, programming and uh, we started discussing the opportunities for parallelism. The reality is that we tend to do or think in parallel. Um, and, and we saw that when you, when you did hardware design, it was ultimate parallel programming, right? Because you were trying to exploit all the concurrency that's there in the hardware in order to do as much as you can in a single clock cycle, right? And, uh, and, and we did lock, talked about uh, uh, pipelining. That's yet another kind of programming, uh, uh, parallel programming, right? So that is, uh, you know, uh, where you're using uh, pipe, the pipeline structure to have multiple instructions in, in, um, um, in, in flight at the same time. And so those are all manifestations of parallel programming. But what I want to stress is the point that in reality, in real life, we do things in parallel all the time, right? We th do things in parallel, but when it came to programming, um, you started with a sequential programming language, and so you're sort of constrained to think in terms of taking something that you can um, express in a parallel form and code it up sequentially, okay? 
Now I'm going to liberate you from that. <laughs> We're going to think about how to do parallel programming um, uh, and, and uh, what it means in terms of um, the mindset that you have to have in order to, uh, uh, to do parallel programming. And then we have to think in terms of what is the programming support you need in order to, do, uh, to develop a, a, a parallel program. And then, and then once you understand the uh, principles behind parallel programming, then we can, because we're all um, uh, getting to be system experts here, uh, we can delve into the details of the system and ask the question, what do we need to do in the operating systems and hardware? Um, we are cold here, so <laughs> anything you can do to get it moving, nothing works. Um, so that's what we're going to uh, uh, we're going to start doing today. And uh, the first thing is, uh, you know, um, I use Zurb as an example, right? When we talked about scheduling, right? And and uh, and, and Zurb was going into the microwave, switching it on, and you know, the, the laundry, and so on and so forth. And just imagine that if he has to be there at every one of these steps, right? So suppose he has to be right next to the, the washing machine for 45 minutes, right? And then only he can move on to the microwave and so on. Obviously, uh, that doesn't work. I mean, and Zorg is a single processor, but he wants to kick these things off. And so even in sequential program, even when you do sequential programming, there is an opportunity. Yeah, no, I want to get that, that one. How did you do it? What did you do? Uh, <laughs> That's it. Most people don't see it. Oh, uh, okay. We we looked for power button everywhere, except except on the side, I suppose. Okay. Uh, and then put the right one down. Right screen, the middle one. Yeah, there you go. And and we have been using this one, right? Okay. Thank you so much, because we came in here, the system was done, I powered it on. So I thought, okay, at least when I, once I powered it on, it should come up. <laughs> it's all connected. Oh. Abhishek, it's all connected, right? And so it's coming off of that. Oh, yeah, oh, that should be connected to this yeah. guy. No, it's okay. I think this is the way it's supposed to be, right? Uh, oh, you, you're, you're recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, not bad. Oh, good. And then we can switch this. Good. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're in business. Um, uh, not that I really needed the slides. I can do without that. Um, but anyhow, so what, what I'm trying to stress is the point that um, even in a sequential program, there's opportunity for parallelism. So, uh, so taking Zerb's real life example, what would be the equivalent thing in a in a program, in a sequential program, in terms of uh, exploiting parallelism? What would be an example? In a program, Charles. Um, no, think, no, don't don't be worried about pipeline. Now I'm re thinking in parallel program, right? So, uh, so the main task for Zurb was talking to his mom on the phone, okay? But he had to do these uh, auxiliary stuff, right? So going and attending to the microwave or uh, turning on the washing machine and things like that. So what is the equivalent of that when you write a program? Any program that you write. Starts with an I and then an O. <laughs> I.O. <right? laughs> so when you do I.O., right? Uh, what Zerb was doing was I.O. when he went to uh, the microwave or, uh, or the washing machine, right? But that need not be done with supervision of Zerb. Same thing is true of the processor, okay? So in the processor, the processors you kick off the I.O. like a disk I.O. But once it does that, it doesn't have a chaperone there because we know that there is an interrupt mechanism that's going to tell me when it is going to, when it's going to be done, right? Like just the, uh, the microwave beeping is telling you that uh, it's done. Similarly, you have the interrupt that is coming back from the device to tell you that the I.O. is done. And therefore, 
um, if you think about it from a parallel programming uh, point of view, you have a main program that is doing some stuff and then you want to do an I.O. You can kick off that I.O. and then let that run in parallel. So that's where threads come into picture. So you can say, well, here is my main program. Here is my main program. And what I want to do is I want to do a, an I.O. activity at some point of time. So let's say I want to do an I.O. activity over here. And uh, either I can do the I.O. activity and wait for it to be complete or I can kick it off by having another thread over here, okay? And, and I'm saying that the I.O. is going to happen over here. And, and so this is my I.O. thread. So there's a main thread and here is an I.O. thread. Right? And the I.O. thread is going off and doing its stuff. And what is happen happening to the main program during this time? It can either wait if it requires the I.O. to be done, right? Or if it can do something else. Zerv, you can continue to talk to your mom, right? So in which case you can continue with this activity, right? And at some point, you may want to listen to what's going on with the I.O. So what you can do is you can continue processing. And at some point, you may require the result of this I.O. Let's say you've done a file I.O and you're reading a file from a disk, then at some point you might need the, uh, uh, the contents of the file to proceed. And you cannot do anything more at that point, right? So then you might block for some amount of time. But you're not blocking the entire amount of time. That's the, 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 the amount of concurrency that you've gotten by, by doing this. And, and uh, once you're done with that, then you can uh, continue with, uh, with the execution. So that's what is uh, happening here is that at this point, the I.O. is done. And during this time, I cannot do anything more until the I.O. is done. That's the reason I'm deciding to wait here. And then once the I.O. is done, I can continue that. So you can see that what we've done is we've taken a sequential program, right? Even within a sequential program, there's opportunity for exploiting um, uh, multiple threads in the same program. Is that idea clear? Okay. So that you don't have to, uh, uh, you, can, you can do some concurrent activity while this I.O. activity is going on. So that's the, the, uh, the uh, lowest form of parallel processing that you can think about, okay, where um, you know, I can only do parallel sequential programming, but still I can exploit threads for doing this sort of concurrent activity in terms of I.O. that I can kick off in parallel with uh, what I'm doing in, um, um, in, in the main program. Um, so this brings up this concept of uh, process versus threads, and we already discussed that early on when we talked about scheduling, that um, process um, is, of course, a thread of control and a, a, a line of execution through the, uh, through the program. And, and similarly, a thread is also a line of execution through the program. And, and uh, the uh, fundamental difference, if you will, between a process and a thread is that process usually is a heavyweight entity. Okay? And, and if you have a um, a web browser, that's a process, right? If you have a completely different program, let's say a, a, an email program, that's a completely different process. Um, and and they, may be, they, they may be executing concurrently. And, and if all of you are sharing, let's say, a single uh, 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 computing resource, you may each of you have your own individual processes, right? So they're all independent processes. But threads are entities that are within a single process. Like for instance, if you think, think about this thread and this thread, they are threads within the same process. And so there is sharing of um, uh, resources, uh, computational resources um, uh, and, and data structures that is happening within the threads that are contained in a single process. But across processes that are completely independent, right? If you have a mail program and a web browser, the data structures and the code and everything is completely distinct, right? But if you take a single program, let's say the mail program, and if there is opportunity for concurrency within that, there are going to be multiple threads within that mail program, and they're all going to share um, uh, data structures and so on. And that's the thing that we're going to see how we express those sharing. But the important thing that we need to do is we know how to create a process, right? The way you create a process is when you click on an icon, um, the operating system kicks in and says, I'm going to load this process from the disk into memory, create a um, uh, um, uh, 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 the memory footprint for the process, and, and the process is ready for execution, right? That's how processes are created, right? And, and we know that in order to maintain these processes, the operating system has the process control block that contains, um, you know, the volatile state of the process, uh, where in memory the process is residing, and all those sorts of things, right? That's containing the process control, control block. 
Now, how do you go from a process to creating a thread within a process? How do we do that? Right now, we don't have any mechanism that we've talked about, right? So what we need is a mechanism by which the operating system allows from inside a process to create a new thread, right? I want to be able to do that. And, and uh, so this is giving you an example of a sequential program. But if I want a true parallel program, what I might do is I might have a, uh, in a parallel program, once again, I might start with the main thread. And, uh, and at some point, I may want to create a new thread, and create a new thread. And once I create the thread, that has its uh, uh, ex uh, 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 existence in parallel with the main thread. Right? And similarly, at some other point, this guy may want to create another thread. So it has its own uh, entity. So this is uh, thread T1, thread T2, and so on. And this guy might create another thread over here, uh, thread T3. So all of these have independent uh, uh, um, existence distinct from the process, main process. And, and uh, so what we need is a mechanism by which I can create a new thread. Right? But in, in, uh, uh, to make our life simpler in terms of how do we go from a mindset in which we know how to write parallel progr uh, sequential programs to writing parallel programs, the simplest way to sort of do that mind shift is to say that, well, in a sequential program, I know how to write my program in a modular fashion. How do I write a sequential program in a modular fashion, Alex? How do I write a sequential program in a modular fashion? One line, oh, that's the first modularity, right? One, one line after the other that is expressing the, uh, uh, what you want to do. Further modularity, Drew? What are the other sources of modularity that I'm getting in a sequential program? Vladimir? Pardon me? Functions, procedures, right? So you're making procedures, and that gives you a modularity, right? Because if you know that something is going to be called from several places in your program, then you can abstract that out into a function, and then write that piece of code. And that, guy, that piece of code can be called from anywhere in the program, right? And that's what is giving you modularity in a sequential program. So we can build on that modularity for a parallel program also. And that is, you know, I want to create a new thread. Now, where is the code for this thread? Right? That is part of what you have to do also, right? So one way to think about it is, let's say you construct a program as consisting of you know, main program and, uh, and procedures uh, that you want, or functions that you want to execute um, as part of uh, uh, your code. And, and once you have done that, then I can say, well, you know, uh, this particular procedure, it will be perfectly fine if I can execute it as a thread, meaning has an independent. Normally, when you think about a sequential program, um, uh, Vladimir's point about function is that from a main program, when I call a function, what is the main program doing? It's waiting, right, for that function to get complete, right? But now in a parallel program, if you determine that that function execution can go on in parallel with the main program, then I can convert that function into a thread. That's the simplest mind shift that you can have going from a sequential program to a parallel program to say that every procedure that you've written in your program can potentially be a thread, an independent thread of execution. Okay? And that, is that mind, set, mind shift clear? So you've written, written a program now in, in the same manner uh, as you would write a sequential program and you've decomposed your, 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 um, your program into a main and then uh, different functions. Each one of those uh, may be doing a specific aspect of your main program. For instance, there may be a function that you've written for sorting. Um, and, and there may be a, a, a function that you've written for um, gathering I.O. Um, so all of those are different functions that you've written. And now what you're saying is, well, in order to convert my sequential program to a parallel program, rather than the main calling a function and waiting for it to complete, I'm going to create a thread that corresponds to that function so that it can go on and have its um, uh, existence and, uh, uh, on its own. So now that I've said that your main program, um, if you look at uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, program now, um, you've, got, you've got your main program, and I've got a whole bunch of functions. Let's say there's a function called foo, um, and there's a function called bar. So these are all functions that I've written as part of the code base for my, uh, for my process. Right? So normally, what I would have done in a sequential program is whenever I want to call foo, I'll call it, and then I'll return. I'll continue with execution and so on. But now what I'm saying is, at any point of time, main can actually fork off a thread, which will start executing 
um, uh, this function foo. And, and, and so now we've got, we've got a thread of control here. And at some point, when I, uh, when I, when I uh, 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 create this thread, so this is create. When I create this uh, uh, thread, then a new thread of execution starts executing here. OK, so this is the main thread. And this is uh, the thread that I created when I forked uh, 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 this foo to be an independent thread. Now, when will this thread terminate? When will T1 terminate? Will it terminate? Shane? When foo finishes, right? So one logical way to think about this is just like in a, in a sequential program when you call a function, when the function, term, when the function call is complete, you return to the main program. In the same manner, in a, in a parallel program, when you create a new thread, the thread starts its own independent execution, and, and main can go on with its own merry way. And this guy will terminate when you hit the end of the procedure. Is that idea clear? So we made this you know, sort of a, um, um, a transition from going from a sequential program to a, a, a parallel program a little bit smooth by saying that let's think of uh, the uh, starting point for a thread uh, uh, execution is a top level procedure that is visible like foo or bar and so on and so forth that you declared at the top level of your, um, of your source code. Okay, that's the first thing. Okay? And the second thing is termination of a thread naturally happens when uh, uh, the function uh, uh, completes its execution. Okay? And, uh, and now this guy, uh, the main, may want to know when a thread that it is forked off actually gets com uh, does, uh, 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 complete. So for instance, I mentioned here that I started an IO activity. And at some point, I may want to know that my IO activity is done. right? And therefore, I want to be able to wait for that. Right? And, and in order to do that, there is a construct that we will introduce called join. Right? And so what main can do is it can create it. And then at some point, it might say that, look, I've done everything that I can on my own. And I, now I want T1 to complete. So I'm going to wait for it. So I'm going to say, you know, um, I'm going to say uh, join with T1. Okay. When I say join with T1, basically I'm going to block. Okay. I'm going to block, and I'll block as long as this guy is uh, still executing. And at some point, he completes. And when he completes, then I can continue my execution. Okay. So I'm blocked here. And then I can continue my execution at this point when T1 is done. Right? So this is a way by which I can wait on another thread that I forked off to, to complete so that I can continue execution. And this can be generalized. I can wait on a bunch of different threads. I can wait on, uh, uh, wait on T1. And, and I can wait on another thread that I may, I may have created, and so on and so forth. And, and, and this is uh, transitive. This guy can wait on a thread that it may have created, and so on. Okay? So that's uh, the way uh, uh, the uh, thread creation and joining and termination is handled. Any questions on that? Is that idea clear? Jen. Hmm? What is data has it? Right. Yeah. OK, so, uh, so what Jen is saying is that this guy is producing something results of which may be needed for this guy, right? In that case, you're going to block, waiting for it to be done, right? That's what you're going to do. And, and, uh, and, and that's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, could be, it could be that I want the functionality of the thread to be done before I can continue with anything, or it may actually be returning some values to me which I want to use in my computation. All of those are good reasons why I, 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 um, uh, I block at this point, right? And blocking essentially ensures that I'm not doing anything uh, 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 strange in my computation, right? I mean, for instance, uh, the data hazard that you're talking about is coming, coming because of the fact that I may have a shared data structure. This is one big program, right? I have data structures declared in this program, and, and I'm returning, and maybe I'm modifying some data structure, and I'm returning some values. I want to use those values in my computation, and that's the reason that um, this uh, uh, join uh, uh, primitive is available to you. But there's a bigger problem, which we'll come to in a minute, which is synchronization. And, and we haven't touched that um, yet. But 
uh, but I want to make sure that up to this is clear with everybody in terms of um, uh, thread creation, joining, and termination. So essentially, these are operations that your operating system should be able to provide you, just like um, you have a loader to go from um, a disk image of a program to a memory footprint. Similarly, once a program is in execution, at any point of time, if we want to create threads within that uh, process, then the operating system has to provide me primitives for creating new threads of execution and, and joining new threads of execution, the execution, executing threads to, um, uh, to coalesce together. Okay, those are um, important constructs. The next thing I want to mention is what I call program order. That you know we're going to quickly get to some of the problems that um, uh, Jin is alluding to. And program order, uh, what that means is that now I've created uh, independent threads of execution. Okay, and once I've created independent threads of execution, then uh, uh, there is no sequentiality anymore, right? This is going on in parallel with this this guy over here, right? And let's say that there's a single processor, okay, there's only a single processor, then the, uh, uh, the execution of these uh, threads, uh, the, the main thread and the, and the thread T1 and T2 and so on, are, ga uh, are getting um, interlaced, right? They are, they are uh, uh, getting executed concurrently, and, and so they are uh, uh, the execution of individual instructions that are coming from this guy, individual instructions coming from this guy are being interlaced together. Okay. However, um, the, uh, from the point of view of a single thread, the execution is exactly in the textual order. That's what is called the program order, right? So your mindset is that if I've written a sequential program, things execute in the sequential fashion, right? That's the first modularity that Alex was pointing out, right? That you have one statement, next statement, third statement, and so on and so forth. And your mindset is that these statements are getting executed in that order in the textual order in which you've written your program, right? And that is what is called the program order, okay? Is that program order exactly the same as would happen on the processor, in the pipeline processor? Um, Matt, okay, Matt says no. Why is that? By the compiler and by the uh, architecture because we know that the pipeline, pipeline processing you can have instructions, uh, you know, several instructions are in flight, right? And therefore, um, you know, you have uh, uh, the, the compiler may rearrange some of these instructions if they are independent of one another. We've seen that. Uh, what is it that allows the compiler to rearrange instructions like that, Matt? There's a, there's a particular concept I mentioned. I'll give you the acronym for that, ILP. Instruction level parallelism. Because we, even though we've written a sequential program, there is no coupling between one statement to another always. There may be sometimes, right? But if there's no coupling, then the, the instructions can be rearranged. And you as a programmer will never see that the program got rearranged because the uh, external impact for you is the results, right? And the results are unchanged by the rearrangement that may have happened um, by the compiler or the hardware. And so that program order has, has got to do with the way you've written this program and what you see is the result, right? And that's, uh, that's important to preserve, right? Because if that is not preserved, you're going to be very unhappy, right? So the program order is going to be preserved um, uh, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the compiler and by the hardware. But now what is going on is that I've created several different threads of execution, right? And within each one of these threads of execution, you are going to have program order, right? Because you've written a program, you know, a, a, a function called foo, and there's a textual ordering of what's going on in this uh, uh, function. Similarly, there's a textual ordering of what's going on in this main program. That program order is going to be preserved. No problem with that. But what can happen is that the interference between the execution of T1 and main can result in some unforeseen happenings, right? Which is uh, uh, what Jim alluded to. And that is, let's say there's a data structure here. Okay, let's say there's a, a, a data structure here. And, uh, and this is a shared data structure between this guy and, and all of the other procedures. If this guy is going to be modifying it, and he's going to be modifying it, then uh, uh, there's going to be a problem because both of these can happen concurrently, and you have no way of telling what's going to, go, going to, going to happen as, a, as the end result of modifying the data structure unless 
we make sure that the accesses to these shared data structures are synchronized, right? So that's the concept. Uh, and, and, and first of all, the problem that you have is what is called a race condition. And race condition comes about because this guy, let's say he wants to write a value into this, and this guy wants to read a value into this, read from this. Then there is a race. Depending on who gets there first, you know, he, he wants to write a value one into this, and he wants to read that same value. And you might get the old value, or you may get the new value, depending on the order in which these instructions get executed. Is that idea clear, that what this data race is all about? The data race comes about because of the fact that a data structure is shared, and multiple threads of execution, maybe um, one of, at least one of them is trying to write to it. Right? If all of them are reading, then there is no data race. Right? If everybody is only reading a data structure, there is no data race. But if at least one of those threads is trying to write to a data structure while others are trying to read to it, then we have a data race. Okay? And, uh, and this data race leads to what is called non-determinism. So this leads to non-determinism. What do I mean by that? What, what do I mean by non-determinism? Pardon me? You cannot be sure of the outcome. And more importantly, if I run the same program again, the result may be different, right? Every time the result may be different. In a sequential program, is it non-deterministic, a sequential program? It will always be deterministic because the order of execution is determined. Um, and, but in a, in, a, in a parallel program, because of the fact that there are concurrent activities going on, there is no telling that the result will be the same. That's why it, it, the, the result can be non-deterministic. And so the whole point is, you want, you want parallel, program, parallel programming because it gives you efficiency. It gives you, you know, hopefully, you can reduce the execution time because you're having concurrent activity and so on. But you want to ha have that while ensuring that you have determinism in the execution. And that's the reason that you need um, uh, synchronization. Okay? And there are two types of synchronization. Um, one I'll call mutual exclusion, another one I'll call rendezvous. And I'll, and I'll um, uh, illustrate that with some simple examples. So let's say, let's say that you know, um, um, I give you the, uh, the test results, and each of you want to come and talk to me about um, the grades that you got. Right? I'm only a single resource. Right? And therefore, if uh, Zerb is talking to me about his test, Ron has to wait. Right? And, and so access of me becomes mutually exclusive, right? So you know, while, while Zerb is um, uh, talking to me, Ron has to wait and vice versa. It depends on who gets there first, right? So whoever gets there first gets me the resource. You can use me as long as you want. Once you release me, somebody else can get me, right? So that's mutual exclusion. And, and, and that's the same thing that happens with this data structure that I'm talking about. Let's say that this guy wants to update this data structure, and this guy wants to read the data structure then what you need to do is you have to somehow get a hold of this and make sure that nobody else is going to get it. Okay? And how can I do that? Well, I can put a lock around it. Right? I can put a physical lock. Um, you know, if, I, if, I have, if you come to my office, I'm going to close the door. <laughs> right? That ensures that you have uh, exclusive access to me. Then well, once I open the door, uh, get you out, then the next guy can come in and, and, and get, get access to uh, the resource. Same thing you're going to do with this, that you're going to lock this data structure. And while this is locked, I can do whatever I want with this, with this data structure. And once I'm done with it, I'll release it, and then somebody else can get access to that. And that ensures that determinism that I'm talking about. Okay? And I used the word atomic early on. Um, do you recall what atomic is? Do you recall what this term atomic means? Abhishek, of, OK, uh, Maba, what is atomic, Chris? Pardon me? For uh, more than that. So you're getting there, Nate? Independent step. So in other words, uninterruptible, right? The key point is the atomic says that that is the smallest granular. I mean, all of you have the right idea, smallest granularity and so on, but it's uninterruptible, right? During the execution of that 
uh, smallest granularity step or whatever you want to call it, the uh, processor cannot be taken away, right. So now we've got concurrent activities. There is a main thread here, a T1 here, and we know that, you know, the operating system is doing scheduling. If there's a single physical processor, then uh, this, pro this main thread is going to be executing for a while, then T1 is going to be executing for a while and so on. And then you have to think about, you know, what is the non-interruptible part of execution of any of these uh, threads? What is a non-interruptible part? Chris, you said uh, 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 the smallest, uh, I, know, I know, maybe Nate said that, right? So what is the smallest non-interruptible part of an execution of a thread um, in, in the, on, on the processor? Single instruction, right? We know that an instruction is indivisible, right? By definition, we made an instruction indivisible. Even if you have a pipeline processor, we still have indivisibility of that instruction, right? So till that instruction is complete, it's either done completely or not at all, right? So an instruction is indivisible, which is good. If instruction is indivisible, is that not enough to avoid data races? Is that not enough? Nate, why is that? Right, so let's take the simple example of a counter, right? So let's say that this guy is doing, what, what main is doing is uh, A gets A plus 1, okay? It's, there's, a, there's an integer A in the program and it is doing A gets A plus 1, okay? And, uh, and this guy is going to say if A equals 5, do something, right? So now you can see that this statement seems like a single statement, right? From a programming perspective, you might think, think that it is a, a single statement, but is it uh, uh, an atomic unit? It isn't. If you look at the instruction set of LC2200, what you would have to do is you have to load this from memory, that's an instruction, and then add this second instruction, store it, third instruction. There are three instructions now, right? And, and, and we want this to be atomic. If we want the changes to this count to be seen as an atomic action, then you want this to be atomic. And that's, a, that's the reason that you have a race condition in a program uh, because the smallest indivisible, uninterruptible um, uh, uh, um, unit of execution is an instruction, right? But what you want is a group of instructions to become atomic, right? For us to get uh, uh, deterministic behavior, we need a group of instructions to become atomic. And that's the reason that you need a higher level entity, which I call a lock, in order to provide you uh, mutual exclusion. So that is one part of it, is mutual exclusion. The second part of it is rendezvous. So Drew is signaling me for time, but I'll, I'll take the break right after I finish this part. So rendezvous, let me illustrate that by a simple example. So let's say that Tim and Peter want to go for a movie, right? And they're roommates, so they, they prearrange that they're going to go for a movie, and each is doing his own thing. So maybe uh, Tim is off uh, studying in the library, and uh, Peter is making dinner. Independent activity is going on, right? and then Tim gets to the theater, what is Tim going to do? He's going to wait, right? Because they decided to go for the movie together, and therefore, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the uh, amount of activity that Tim and Peter have individually, one of them is going to get to the movie theater ahead of the other, right? But they want to rendezvous before they can continue execution, which is seeing the movie, right? So in that case, that's the second kind. So this is, this is different from the mutual exclusion. In the mutual exclusion, there's a single resource and you know, multiple um, um, entities are trying to get access to that. Whereas in rendezvous, what you want is you want to carry on with your independent activity. At some point, you want to come back together so that you can do something common uh, uh, from that point on. And that's exactly what we illustrated here. We said that you know they're doing independent activities at some point main says, oh, I cannot go on any further without T1. I need the results of T1's execution, so it is waiting for it, joining, right? Joining is an example of a rendezvous between threads. And these are two things that are needed in, in any parallel program, right, to get determinism. The first thing is mutual exclusion because when you have shared data structures and you want to modify it and, and another person wants to access it, you have to make sure that those modifications happen in a mutually exclusion, exclusive manner. And rendezvous is needed when, when, when you're forked off a concurrent activities. At some point, you want to say, well, you know, um, um, I want to wait for the results of the other guy, okay? In that case, you need a rendezvous, right? Is that idea clear, these two concepts? Okay, once these are clear, then we can talk about how to write a parallel program 
um, using the concepts that I've mentioned so far. Okay, let's take a short break, and when we come back, we can look at how to write a parallel program. Okay. So now we're going to have some fun. I'm going to give you buggy code, and we're going to fix uh, to write a parallel code, right? So first of all, let me motivate that with a simple example. I mean, you've seen cameras everywhere, right? There are you know cameras on the highway. There's cameras on you know in the inside buildings and so on. And and uh, one of the uses for that is to sort of uh, uh, to to look for anomalous activities, right? So anything that is uh, that is not um, that's something that that you have to analyze. So um, to uh, to think about <clears throat> what might be going on uh, when you have a camera like this is that in terms of processing, if if there's an analog camera, for instance, you have to take the camera, take an image, and and pixelize it, convert it into pixels. Um, and once you once you convert into pixels, then you can you can track. If uh, let's say that you know Kishore is a suspicious guy, um, and if I'm going to observe his movement, then I'm tracking uh, the movement of Kishore on the camera, right? So that's what is going on in the tracker, and and uh, and and maybe what what you are, what you are what you've instructed the, the the camera to do is, anytime Kishore appears <laughs> in the scene, raise an alarm, <laughs> right? And uh, so these are activities that you want, that you want to digitize the image as it is coming in, um, and you track, uh, meaning analyze the image to, to look for objects of interest. And when an object of interest comes in, um, you want to raise an alarm, right? This is what you're doing. And, and, and you can see that you can write a sequential program for this, right? Take an image, digitize it, then, then track it, and then raise an alarm if, uh, uh, if if the if the object that you're looking for is not seen, then go on and get the next image and so on. But remember that this is a 24/7, right? You know, something that's happening 24/7. Videos, images are continuously coming in, and you want to continuously digitize the image as they come in, and continuously track each image, contents of each image, and 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 potentially raise an alarm if you want, right? So you can see that there is a pipeline here, right? Just like an instruction pipeline, you have a a function pipeline here, right? You're digitizing, tracking, raising an alarm, right? It is just that it is coarser than a single instruction, but it is nevertheless a pipeline of tasks that you want to do. And it is not, um, it's not that you're done with uh, taking a single image, analyzing it, right? Because continuously uh, images are coming in. And so what you can do is you can convert these functions into threads. And this guy can be digitizing the current image. This guy can be uh, uh, analyzing the previous image, and this guy can be raising an alarm based on the results of the previous image if, if necessary, right? So these are concurrent activities. You can immediately see that even if you wrote a sequential program, you can convert it into a parallel program because this cries for per exploiting parallelism. Is that idea clear? Okay. So you can see a very simple example of how you know parallelism can be exploited, um, and 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 the kind of parallelism that you're exploiting here is the pipeline parallelism, right? You're not taking a single digitizing task and breaking it into, um, into uh, multiple threads. What we're doing is just like you did instruction level parallelism for a processor design, we're doing task level parallelism um, in this pipeline, right? So we are analyzing the previous image, raising an alarm based on the one prior to that, and, and you are digitizing the current image, right? So these are concurrent activities that, you, that you're able to do in, um, uh, in, in uh, uh, in this simple example. Is the example clear? Okay. If the example is clear, then we're going to go and look at how to parallelize, how to develop a parallel program for this. So we need a, um, a, a, a code for this guy, a code for this guy. Right? And what I want is, you know, and we have no idea. So in the case of an instruction pipeline, in the case of an instruction pipeline, what we had was uh, 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 how did we make sure that, uh, that there is no um, uh, that there is no um, uh, blockage in the pipeline. How did we make sure? Huh? But no meaning, meaning nobody is waiting on another guy, right? So we had multiple stages, but we made sure that no stage is waiting on another stage. How did we make sure of that, uh, Brian? A equal amount of work, right? That was the key. We were making sure that each one of them had about right just about the equal amount of work, and we had a sync, you know, clock that on a clock, everybody goes to the next instruction. On a clock, everybody goes to the next instruction. 
and, and we made sure that every stage is doing just about equal amount of work so that nobody is waiting on a previous guy to, to finish because we know that that can be a killer in terms of pipeline performance. But in the case of a parallel program, we have no, no way of controlling that, right? Because there's a functionality, you know, whatever how amount of code is needed to do the digitization. And there's another functionality. We don't have any idea how much time the tracking is going to take and so on. So in this case, what we really need to do is we need to, and, and, and remember that um, this is a concurrent activity with this, which means that if I have multiple processors, uh, there could be a, a processor that is executing this code, another processor that is executing this code, and so on. But this guy cannot start on the next image until the first, the digitizer has digitized the, the, the current image, right? Right? So in that sense, there's a coupling between these guys, and just like you had a buffer in the pipeline processor, we need to put a buffer in between these guys, right? So that when the digitizer is done digitizing an image, it can stuff it into the buffer. And let's for the moment forget about this guy. Let's just focus on the digitizer and the tracker as the two, two things. And then that generalizes to an arbitrary parallel program. So we need a buffer in between these two guys. And, and the semantics of this buffer is, you know, just like we had the count example, I want to digitize and put it into this, and, and the tracker is going to see if there is a, an image uh, ready for me to process, take, takes it and processes it. And once it is done processing, a particular image can go back and get the next one and so on, right? That's the kind of thing that needs to happen, right? No, so if you have a buffer, let's say, let's say I have an infinite buffer. If, I'm in, if an infinite buffer between these two guys, then digitizer can com continuously keep putting stuff into that, right? But in reality, as you uh, probably have guessed, it's going to be a bounded buffer, right? So data structure, after all, right? Um, so it's a bounded buffer, and therefore, you know, um, you may have to find out when the buffer space is available so that it can produce a new image. On the other hand, tracker has to necessarily wait, right? Till there is a valid image available in the buffer before it can do the processing, right? That's the coupling that exists. So I mentioned uh, uh, mutual exclusion and and um, um, and and um, uh, rendezvous. Uh, both of those things come together in this simple example. So let's let's uh, start looking at how to develop code for this. Um, uh, so all of these we've talked about. Um, so so now what we have is uh, we have a buffer that's available um, uh, between the tracker and the digitizer. And what I'm going to do is, I'm, I, in order, and since it is a bounded buffer, there's going to be you know, finite size to this. And, and I'm going to have two pointers. Okay? There's a head pointer and there's a tail pointer. And the tail pointer is a place where the digitizer is going to put an image that it produces. Okay? It pixelizes an image and then puts it into uh, this data structure pointed to by the tail pointer. That is the first. Um, empty slot in what I'm calling the frame buffer, okay? And uh, the head is telling me, you know, what uh, the, uh, the the first available item for the tracker to take and analyze, right? And and you can see, uh, going back to Ryan's question, the um, uh, the digitizer went much faster, and therefore it has produced a whole bunch of images, right? It produced a whole bunch of images and put it into this buffer. And, and, and the next image it produces, it will put it over here. And on the other hand, the tracker is taking images one by one from the head, processing it, getting to the next one, and so on and so forth. If they are perfectly synchronized, then the, uh, what will be the size of the buffer that you would need? If they're perfectly synchronized, meaning the amount of time that a digitizer takes is exactly the same as what the tracker would need, you, you, one is enough, right? Because that will make sure that you know if, when this guy is ready for the next uh, uh, image, the digitizer will have it, right? But because of the fact that um, there is vagaries in the execution of these uh, threads, um, you need a, a, a buffer that is uh, bigger than one, so that you can have this uh, buildup to happen, and um, and 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 that way uh, the uh, tracker can can retrieve the first available image, work on it, and then go on to the next one, and so forth. So, so this is the, the, the um, uh, data structure that you need, and this is a shared data structure, right? And since it is a shared data structure, you need synchronization between these two guys, okay? And where do I need synchronization? If I look at this data structure, where, do, where all do I need? What is the synchronization that is needed between the digitizer and the tracker in order to make, make this all happen? Michael? 
first of all, look at this data structure and tell me what parts of this data structure. So there are, there are several things in this data structure, right? There is the data structure itself. What is this data structure? It's an array, right? It's an array of frames, right? And then there are two pointers, head pointer and a tail pointer, right? Tail pointer is the place where the uh, digitizer is going to place the next image that it produces. Head pointer is the place where the uh, tracker is going to take the next image that it wants to process, right? So these are all the data structures that I've defined between the digitizer, digitizer and the tracker. Now tell me uh, what, is the, what are private to these guys or what we need synchronization? Between? Why is that? Okay, okay. Uh, how many agree with what Michael said? Uh, Matt, you agree with what Michael said. Ryan, you also agree? Anyone disagree with that? All, all of you seem to be in agreement, right? Maba, Ryan, are you agreeing, disagreeing? No, but, but okay, t tell me now, I, as I mentioned, the tail pointer is used by the digitizer to place an image into the frame buffer, right? Does the tracker ever need to look at the tail pointer? Yes? Okay, uh, uh, Shane? Oh, okay, uh, so it, it, you might have to do that and that is part of the operating system. Operating system may say, well, the buffer is full and therefore the digitizer cannot really run, right? And therefore it can give more cycles to the, the tracker so that it can catch up, right? That's part of what is going to happen sort of naturally because once the digitizer finds that it cannot do any more work, it's going to block, right? At that point, the process cycles can be given to somebody else, right? An, an available frame, right? So they, they need to look at head and tail pointers. So if you look at, let's first look at all the operations that may happen on the head and tail pointer. Uh, the operations that can happen on the tail pointer is that the digitizer places a new image here, and then it is going to bump up the tail pointer, right? And so modification of the tail pointer is done by both digitizer and the tracker or only the digitizer? Only the digitizer, right? Only the digitizer is going to modify the tail pointer. And similarly, only the tracker is going to modify the head pointer because if it takes an image from here, then it's going to bump up the tail head pointer to move to the next image. So bumping up or modifying the uh, pointers, the tail pointer is going to be done only by the digitizer. The uh, head pointer is going to be done only by the tracker, right? But as all of you pointed out, comparing or uh, reading the pointers is going to be done by both guys because you need to know, the digitizer needs to know if there is more space to be put into, um, into the uh, uh, buffer and, and, and it knows that by looking at whether the head pointer and the tail pointer are, are the same, right? And similarly, the uh, tracker needs to look at both the head and the tail pointer to, to see if, if the buffer is empty or full, okay? So those are, uh, those are things that uh, uh, that might that might need to happen. Now, what I can do is, um, you you are right about that. So let me introduce another variable to make life a little simpler and decouple um, the digitizer and the tracker, and that is to introduce a new variable which I'll call buff availability. Okay, and buff availability says how many buffer spaces are available right now. Okay, to start with, when you start the program. Entire buffer is available. Let's say that you know this has got 100 entries here, right? So zero through 99. So um, the availability, buff availability, is equal to 100 to start with, right? And every time the uh, 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 the, the uh, digitizer places um, uh, a frame into uh, this frame buffer, what is it going to do? It is going to decrement the buffer availability by one. And similarly, when this guy uh, 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 when this guy takes uh, a frame from, from the buffer to analyze it, this is the tracker, 
then it will really bump up the buffer availability by one, right? So that's what uh, 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 the digitizer and the tracker are going to do. So they, they haven't still fixed the, uh, the top of this. And so when the guy came, I should have mentioned it to him. But anyhow, you can see that the digitizer thread is going to decrement the buffer availability by one every time it puts a new frame into this uh, frame buffer. And similarly, the tracker is going to increment the buffer availability by one, uh, by one every time it, it takes a frame for analysis, right? So given that, now you tell me, do I need synchronization for head and tail? Now I don't need it, right? Because the comparison is the reason that you all needed it. But I made it uh, distinct by saying that the head pointer is going to be only updated by, um, uh, uh, by, the, um, uh, uh, by, by the tracker. And, and the tail pointer is going to be only updated by, um, uh, uh, by the digitizer. And there is no coupling between these two guys. And therefore, um, these are two private variables. Everybody with me here? OK. So I don't need synchronization for accessing the head and tail pointers. Shashank. Well, so this is a circular buffer, right? Oh. So it's a circular buffer, so we're just going to wrap around to the beginning. So when tail is eventually used to for the head of right. then you need to know that it's the left tail the, So remember that the only thing we care about is the buffer availability. That's the one that is telling me what space is available, right? So that's, that is telling me exactly how much space is available. And this is just a pointer into this circular buffer, right? And since this is a circular buffer, I'm going to wrap around to zero when I reach the end of this. Right? Each of these pointers is going to do that. And what we have done is we have sort of taken this data structure and then analyzed what parts of it needs to be shared between these threads and what can be independent. And once you decide something is shared, then you know that you need synchronization for that. Right? And uh, what about the frame buffer itself? This is a data structure that is shared. Do I need synchronization for accessing this? Do I need synchronization for accessing the, the frame buffer itself? Right. And, and more importantly, the reason why you're not accessing the same point is because you have uh, distinct pointers, right? And what you need is only an index into that array. The contents of that array, once you have that index is uniquely determined, contents of that array, you know that you can, you can access it without any uh, synchronization. Is that idea clear? The contents of the buffer itself doesn't need synchronization. And we also s determined that the head and tail pointers don't need synchronization. Only thing that needs synchronization is just knowing how much buffer space is available, right? So this is very, very important in terms of thinking through a problem and trying to figure out where do we need synchronization, right? So you, know, you have to make sure that because you, you remember that um, uh, the example that I gave of mutual exclusion, right? Uh, what happens is uh, me as a resource is unavailable, <laughs> right? The minute uh, uh, it's dedicated for uh, one one uh, student, and and therefore you want to make sure that the amount of time you hold the shared resource is as small as possible. Otherwise, you don't have any concurrent activity, right? So what we're going to see is um, how to develop a correct program, a parallel program um, that that works correctly given the properties that we want. We want to make sure that. Um, when I access a buffer from the tracker, we know that that buffer content is, um, is valid. And similarly, when I want to place something into the buffer, I know that, that there's a spot available for me to place the uh, content. So this is fairly simple. We'll see how we can develop um, a, a parallel program for that. So this is the first attempt at that. Um, so this is saying, you know, the digitizer is saying, if the buffer availability is greater than 0, okay, so this is the data structure, right? So there is um, uh, 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 and remember that this is uh, a, a, a top-level procedure. This is another top-level procedure. And from main, I forked off a digitizer. I forked off a tracker to go on. Um, and, and these two procedures never terminate, right? Because it's a continuous. I earlier, earlier said that a, um, a thread terminates when the procedure terminates. But because of the fact that we want to <clears throat> we want to do this 24/7, we want the digitizer to continuously loop. Uh, producing new images, and we want the tracker to continuously loop um, uh, analyzing new images. And, and so outside of um, uh, these uh, uh, procedures is the frame buffer, which is a common data structure, which is the global scope, right? Everybody can see that. And similarly, buffer veil is a global data structure. Outside, 
in the in the global scope that both the uh, digit, digitizer and the tracker can see it. And you can see now that the tail is a local variable for this procedure, head is a local variable for, for this procedure. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So these are the only two data structures that are shared, buffer veil and frame buff. And we all agreed that bu frame buff does not need any synchronization, right? Frame and buffer veil is the only thing that requires synchronization. And so the logic of this program is very simple. It is basically looping forever, checking if um, uh, there is availability of uh, buffer space. If there is, then it grabs a new image, digitizes it, and, and once it has digitized it, it is going to place the digitized image into the uh, frame buffer at the uh, location pointed to by the tail. And, and Shashank, this is where it is actually looking at the fact that it is um, a circular buffer by doing tail mod max because tail is continuously increasing. Remember that, think of this as a 64 bit machine, uh, you know, tail will never wrap around. So it is going to continuously monotonically increase. And so what you are doing is um, you are taking the tail mod max to know the position in the frame buffer where you want to stick the image and, and you are incrementing uh, uh, tail and, and you are decrementing buffer wheel and that is what the, uh, the, the digitizer does. On the tracker side, what the tracker is doing is it is looking at buffer wheel and seeing if it is less than max. Okay? If it is less than max, it knows that there is a new image. If buffer availability is max, then it knows that there is no new image. right? And when it is less than max, it knows that there is a new image, then it can, it can um, um, uh, uh, tra the, the tracking image, uh, the image to track is, is given by the head pointer. And, and once it has grabbed the, uh, 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 the image to be tracked into this track image, it can bump up the uh, head pointer and it can uh, increment uh, the buffer availability and start analyzing the track image. Remember that this part of it uh, is, is, not some, is, is something that can go on in parallel with anything else that is happening in the entire system because it has grabbed the image that it wants to track and it can start processing it. Right? So in the whole um, uh, structure that I have shown here, this statement and this statement are the ones that are thorny. Right? Those are the things that, uh, that are modifying buffer veil. Okay? And, um, and these are inspecting buffer veil, reading buffer veil. But these are the ones that are modifying buffer veil. Right? Even if you, even if you don't um, have synchronization to access to read something, it's okay, right? All that you might do is um, you might find that there is no buffer availability, and you might cycle around and come back again. Eventually, you'll see it. But on the other hand, modifications have to be done in a synchronized fashion, okay? And so now, given the structure, one simple thing that I can do is, since I want, I, I look at buffer avail as the key thing that um, that needs synchronization. And, and it is contained in this um, if statement, um, what I can do is I can, I can define a, a lock and, uh, and obtain a lock. And, um, and, and by the way, uh, uh, the, the, the lock primitive has two parts to it. One is uh, obtaining a lock and then releasing the lock. Right? So between the, once you, once you um, well, if I have declared a lock variable L1, okay, so this is a lock variable. Again, this is the data structure that needs to be provided by the operating system for you with certain semantics. And the semantics is that you can say lock L1 and unlock L1. And within this, the sequence of statements that you have are atomic. What I mean is that so long as you hold this lock, um, you know, this portion of code is going to be done in a mutually um, exclusive manner with anyone else who wants the same lock, right? You can get interrupted, you may go away, somebody else may run, but if that some other process tries to get the same lock, you won't be able to get it, right? Because you hold the lock, right? In that sense, this piece of code that you have here can, can execute entirely in a mutually exclusive fashion with respect to any other uh, thread that also needs to say, access the same lock. Is that idea clear? Okay, so um, and and so given that semantics, um, what we can do is we can take this pre previous uh, uh, piece of code and and uh, um, introduce <coughs> introduce a, a lock uh, a statement around it. So what I've done now is this is the original piece of code, right, for the digitizer. What I've done is I've said let's get a lock which is associated. I'm, I'm making an association 
in my program that I'm going to declare a new lock called buff lock, okay, it's a data structure, and I'm going to say that the buff lock is the one that gives me access, unique, uh, mutually exclusive access to this variable which I'm calling buff avail. And so I'm going to get that lock and then do this piece of code, unlock it, okay. Similarly, on the tracker side, I'm going to get that lock and, and do this piece of code and then unlock it, okay. And this is going to make sure that I have mutual exclusion when I want to access these um, uh, data structures. Um, is this good? Will, it'll, will it work, first of all? It will work, right? Shane? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so the first thing that you observe is that we have a correct program, but it is not parallel. There's no concurrency at all, right? So what we've done is, you know, we put this concurrent, we put this lock at too coarse a level, that it actually it's giving you a correct execution, but I've gotten no performance advantage of uh, uh, making it a parallel program, right? Because we put the lock around the entire piece of code here, okay? So that's bad. So this is not good, right? And and we know that it's really this guy buff availability that requires um, uh, uh, locking and unlocking. And therefore what we're going to do is we're going to modify this. Um, and like I said, I'm going to give you a successive uh, implementation of the simple program which are erroneous in some fashion. And you have to tell me what is erroneous and then we can try to fix it. So the first er error is uh, what Shane pointed out that you've got a correct program but it is not parallel, <laughs> right? So that's no good. So we'll, we'll fix that. Um, and what we're going to do is um, uh, we're going to say uh, uh, we're going to put b b b because it is the buffer wheel that's the thing that we care about. Um, wherever buffer wheel was there, we're going to put locks around that. So here um, I change the um, uh, uh, I'm going to wait on buffer wheel <coughs> um, uh, so long as it is a, a zero, then I cannot really digitize any more images, right? So while it is zero, I'm doing nothing. Okay, and because I'm inspecting buffer wheel, okay, and buffer wheel can be modified by uh, by the other guy, I'm going to put a mutual exclusion lock around that, right? So I'm going to lock buff, uh, uh, this buff lock and check if buffer wheel is zero, and if it is zero, I'm going to wait and and f uh, and eventually when it becomes non-zero, I'm going to unlock it and do whatever I need to do. And similarly, again, when I want to modify buffer wheel, I'm getting the lock and unlocking it. And similar thing is happening on the tracker side. It is um, so long as there is, there is uh, the buffer availability is max, meaning no images are available. I'm going to basically do nothing. Um, and I and, and since it is inspecting a shared variable, I'm going to lock. Uh, I'm going to obtain the lock and unlock it at the end of it. And similarly, since I'm modifying the shared variable, I'm going to get a lock and unlock it. Right. So is this program good? Why is why is it not good? So, so uh, wait. So, uh, here I'm, I'm I'm checking if it is zero, and we're expecting that it is going to change to non-zero at some point. Where will it change? Who will change it? The other thread, right? The other thread is the one that has got to change it. And where is it happening? Over here, right? And this guy also needs the same lock, right? And this is what is called a deadlock, right? I mean, you've seen uh, you know in a wrestling match. Uh, you, know, you have a deadlock and the referee has to come and then get them apart, right? And uh, so this is what is happening. It's called a deadly embrace. That's another word that is used for this. It's a deadlock. And there's a particular kind of deadlock called live lock. And what I mean by that is this guy is doing something, right? It is doing something, but it is useless computation that it is doing. It's continuously checking if this is going to change, right? Um, but it is not going to change. It doesn't know that, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and the change has to happen from here, and he cannot change it because he's not, get, he's not getting the lock, okay? And the same coupling he, exists between these two guys. Is that idea clear? This is deadlock. This is the idea of a deadlock, okay? And, and, and uh, so this is obviously um, an erroneous program, so we have to fix it, okay? And um, any idea how we can fix, fix it? Sir? Right, 
So one thing that what Zerub is saying is, hey, why do you care about reading? Because reading, at most, you can read the old value. That's okay. Eventually, it's going to change. You're going to see it. And therefore, why not remove the locks around these guys, right? So you can simply remove the locks around these guys and keep the locks only around the places where you're modifying it, okay? Because modifying is something that you have to do under the protection of a lock. So we're going to do that. So the next fix for that is a Zerb's fix, which is essentially get rid of the mutual exclusion lock around this, right? So now this is saying while uh, uh, buffer veil is zero, do nothing. Just keep waiting. Um, actually, it's not waiting. What is it doing? It's not waiting. It is doing what is called spinning. It's, this is what is called a spin lock. So a spin lock. So what it is doing is it is spinning uh, uh, on the same value, right? Over and over it is inspecting the same value. Eventually, that value is going to change when the digitizer gets into action and uh, the tracker gets into action and um, uh, uh, gets an image for, um, for tracking. It is going to say, well, I've got a, uh, I've taken one image off of the frame buffer. I'm going to increment uh, buffer veil. At that point, um, it's, 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 this is going to see a new value and it will come out of this while loop, okay? Is that idea clear? Is this program correct? Scott? No, oh, no, uh, Taylor, right? Taylor, is it correct? Uh, so the program works, okay? Um, and there is also concurrency, right? There is concurrency. Uh, program works, but is there anything that is not satisfying about it? Pardon me? Yeah, so, so what Ron is saying is that um, this is consuming processor cycles, right? And, and when, when it cannot do really anything useful, it is consuming processor cycles. And especially if it's a single processor that you've got, then you are basically consuming some processor cycles for doing useless computation. What you really want is to be able to block this guy, okay? You know, just like, you know, Zerb's example of uh, doing his microwave cooking, right? So you want that signal to come to say that, well, your, your microwave beeped. Go and take this uh, food from the microwave, right? In a similar f a fashion, what you want is you want to be able to check this once. If it is zero, then you say, well, I cannot do anything. I'm going to block. I'm going to let the other guy tell me when I can unblock so that I can do something useful with it, okay? And that's what we want to do. But right now, this, the primitive that I've described to you, which is mutual exclusion lock, doesn't give me that ability of waiting for an event, right? So the, all that we can do is obtain a lock. That's the only uh, primitive I, I, I've uh, um, exposed to you. But what, what Ron wants is a new primitive that says that check a predicate, and if you find the predicate to be false, then you wait, okay? And then what has got to happen from the other side? The other side has got to signal me, right? So you want this uh, semantics of a new primitive that allows me to wait for an event and another guy to signal an event, right? And, and that is what is called condition variable, which we'll see on, on Thursday. So condition variable. And, and condition variable will let you do exactly what Ron wants us to do, which is um, when you find that some condition, in this case, the condition you're waiting for is whether buffer wheel is uh, uh, non-zero. Um, and, and you want to wait for that condition. When the condition is available, then you want to start execution again, okay? And, uh, and we will see how we can fix this program to do that on Thursday.